I think is someone who is very much about uh, just just Get FYI, you know, Porcupine. This is this is for Porcupine Jason specifically because he we've been going back and forth over this. All right, this is specifically right. because of Porcupine Jason. I'm asking okay. this question, okay. and I know I'm gonna get most people disagreeing with me, but whatever, I don't care. Okay. Hey everybody. Hello. How are you all doing? So I got an interview, quick interview here with Jack Oliver. We're just going to, it's a free flow conversation. We're just going to chat about socionics related topics and all that. Right. Okay. So, yeah, um, you, 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 we were talking about your theory of moving away from demonstrative to um, mobilizing. Yes. Well, it, it's a broader theory, which is that there are transitions between functions. Um, between specifically the evaluatory <clears throat> and situational functions. I see the evaluatory functions as almost like the baseline, right? They're the ones which are consistently either on or off. And so in absence of a situation, you just have your evaluatory situation. So your evaluatory functions, either at a high signal or a low signal, and it's only due to situations that come across that we have fluctuations away from that towards a situational function. Each evaluatory function is paired with a situational function. So a leading is paired with the role. Um, the vulnerable is paired with the creative. The demonstrative is paired with the mobilizing. And the suggestive is paired with the ignoring. And they exist almost at like opposite poles on the spectrum. So to move away from one, you move towards the other. Right. Now, what's interesting about the theory is that it, runs, it is contrary to the popular belief that's being spread around in uh, MBTI spheres, which is to avoid your mobilizing slash tertiary function. And that's kind of what I find, why I find this theory actually kind of fascinating is because while everybody's telling you to avoid using your mobilizing... Oh. Stay away from you the loop. Don't hurt loop. Yeah, yeah, avoid the loop. Yeah. Don't use the, yeah. the, the that. Yeah. Yeah, the guy who came up with that, I don't think he's ever made any sense <laughs> in anything regard relative to do with typology or to do with other topics. Uh, I, I I don't think he makes the slightest bit of sense. Interesting. I think he has confused a lot of people in typology, unfortunately. All right. I think there's a lot of people confusing others in typology in general. That's why I yeah. always say you need to like think things through critically. I've noticed yeah. something about you is you tend to call people out quite a lot, which is actually, yes. I think, is a good thing. Now, I want to understand why do you do that and what is your philosophy behind calling people out, breaking down their ideas, critiquing them and all that sort of stuff? Because we live in an absolute mess of meaning. What does that there mean? There is no... As in people spouting all sorts of different ideas and no one is being blunt enough to actually navigate that. So you've got different ideas spouted by different people. Does it make sense? Does it not? No idea. You're not going to get to any kind of truth unless we actually hammer that out. And sometimes you do have to be blunt about it. And I'm not usually a very blunt person, but I think you've got to say when something's been been an idea has now floated around lots of people have talked about this idea some people have come to believe in it it makes sense to say well i know where the idea came from i know the person who came up with that idea and i don't think their thinking is very good and i think that actually we should rethink this idea and maybe replace it with something better now of course it's about having a discussion about what would be better i think what, what socionics provides is better I don't think that um, this idea that you that there's some sort of unhealthy dom turt loop that people are in. I say not on the contrary. I think that most people, um, if they have any kind of development, will develop into their mobilizing function. Now, that's not to say that it's entirely wrong. I think there is a kernel of truth, which is that when you go into your mobilizing function, especially when you're not so mature and developed. 
it actually is insufferable to everyone else around you. Because it's not strong, it's weak. So it's not necessarily effective, and it probably can annoy people, especially when you're so buoyed up by confidence in that area. And so I, I don't think it's a linear growth thing either. I think it's more like a spiral. So you go into this area of, of risk, the area where you're sort of teetering on the edge of falling over and you feel highly engaged and highly uh, rewarded in what you're doing. But when you slip up, and you fall flat on your face and you make a fool of yourself. And then it takes a while before you muster up the confidence to try again. And next time you try, you actually fare better this time. So, yeah, still you'll fall flat on your face eventually, but it'll be a bit longer this time before you next fall flat on your face. And I think that's a key part of a human experience. I think that's what almost all humans go through in some way or another. And I think that the, mob the relationship between the demonstrative and the mobilizing describes that for different people of different types. Interesting. Okay. Um, so I had a question I wanted to ask you, but it escaped my mind right now. Okay. Yeah. So what do you think about, what, what is your response to people who critique you for not opening up to other models? Like, well, will they say, well, you're not considering model G, you're not considering that model over there. What are your thoughts about that? Well, for instance, I spent weeks opening up to model G. Right. Like weeks. And it takes hours of your time. It takes your whole evening trying to get into it and understand what's going on and trying to dive deeper and deeper and trying to be as open-minded as possible, right? I am a very open-minded person. People who know me will tell you I'm a very open-minded person. Anyone who gets to know me realizes that very quickly. People tell me off for being too open-minded, for giving, giving things too much of a chance. The problem is that so many of the other ideas are such dross compared to mm. socionics but it looks to people from an external perspective that i'm very closed-minded yeah i'm not i give all or any idea more than just one chance many chances i'll spend a whole evening talking about that idea with someone should i be able to find the time would love to do so the problem is none of it holds water in comparison and I say none of it, not in terms of there's nothing possible that will ever. No, no, there probably is something out there that's better than socionics. It just has not yet come to my doorstep. And I've gone out searching and looking for said thing and it still have not happened upon it. Mm -hmm. So people, I retain an open invitation to all, all people to bring better ideas to me so that I may learn and benefit from them and maybe be a useful ally in actually getting other people on board. The problem is no one can bring anything that's any good. And I've reached the point of quite quickly being able to determine what's quite good because I can see where it's going because I've seen it many times before. And even then, I'll give it a lot more of a chance than any other person with a, a, an understanding of socionics anywhere near my own. People like that are far more closed off than I am. Right. No. If you talk to my friend Peter, he will not give it the time of day. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You talk to, so, you know, I, I am, if you put me in context, I'm exceedingly open minded. I think we need to remind ourselves ILEs are not LSIs, basically. <laughs> yes. But I'll look like an LSI to someone who, you know, comes to me with an idea they think is unique. And to me, it's not unique. I've seen it before. No. And I can see all the flaws in it pretty quickly. And if I rip it apart, for some people, they don't necessarily even realize I've ripped it apart because I've fought it through at a level they're not used to thinking it through. And so it hasn't made that connection. That's my failure for actually making it clear, not making it clear enough to them. But they'll assume it's because, oh, I'm just, I'm open-minded. Or some mm. people just reach for your, your closed-minded they reach yeah, yeah. for that yeah, and yeah. then add hominem. No, I know, I know. I, I've kind of encountered the same thing a little bit, especially regarding mm -hmm. like typing methods and stuff like this. It's like you, you you don't understand. Like we've spent a lot of time thinking about this stuff, and there's a reason why we disagree with it, right? So okay, fair enough, yeah. fair enough. I don't know. I think people on the internet they just try to have a uh, what's it called? They want to feel like they asserted their opinion somehow that they were important or significant so they tried to influence other people try to get them to adopt things and when you don't they they, they, they get pissed off and stuff like that yeah the internet is a, is a weird place to be honest 
in general. Um, right. So, um, so I wanted to, there, I could have talked about celebrity typing. I mean, I recently, okay, I made a post on your group and I think it's pretty interesting. All right. And I know you're against DC and H, but I think the post is pretty interesting because remember when I, we talked about Tarantino, you told me he was yes. LIE. I was like, maybe let's see. And then he's actually an LIE. He really is an LIE, which was interesting. Yeah. So and you compared him to Christopher Nolan, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That post. I compared yeah. him to Christopher Nolan and I talked about how yeah. they present differently. So what are your thoughts about DC and H and being able to explain that? The differences of behavior within the same type? Because they're both clearly the same type, but one is very calm and relaxed and doesn't have that stereotypical SE mobilizing SI polar. That's Christopher Nolan, where the other one is, he can't sit still for more than two seconds. So what are your thoughts? Well, I would wonder if DC and H is the right way of explaining those differences. So I can say, yes, there's a difference. I look at Christopher Nolan, look at Quintantino, one is clearly far more frenetic than the other. Does that mean, therefore, that DC and H is the way to describe it? Maybe there's a better way of describing it. The reason I am less inclined to say, oh, there's DC and H, is that, well, first of all, what is DC and H? It talks about the dominant, a dominant subtype, a creative subtype, a normalizing subtype, and a harmonizing subtype. It makes the assertion that the the way of breaking apart um, uh, people of the same type is by looking at in terms of how dominant, how assertive they are, essentially, how creative, so more out of the box and sort of independently minded they are. Perhaps a little bit of freneticness is included in there. That normalizing, they're a bit more sort of structured and um, pedantic in how things need to go together and make sense. Or they're more sort of peacekeeping in their nature. That these are the most salient ways of telling them apart. When you've already worked out, you know, where they lean in those sorts of traits anyway, based on their type. So that's already, it sounds a bit weird. But you could then say, okay, well, well okay. So maybe Christopher Nolan is a bit more harmonizing for an LIE. And maybe Quentin Tarantino is a bit more creative for an LIE. But you could equally say that um, Quentin Tarantino is a bit more, well, um, melancholic for an LIE. Or maybe he's a bit more um, inclined. Maybe he's a bit more effeminate than, than other LIEs. Maybe he's a bit more... Um, psychotic, psychotic, but you can use any come up with any trait, right? He's a bit more this than the average LIE. So, why DC and H? So, the way I, I, I think of it is on the one hand, there's going to be countless variances between people of the same type because we're not just the type, we're also the type is simply a um, a hierarchy of um of ways of metabolizing information it's not the be all and end all of a person a person has their genetic code which is far more complicated than the variances of socionics and they also have their connectome you know their their brain which is the sum total of not only their genetics but also their experiences and their memory formations that is so complex we have not been able to create and 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 in and sort of find you know, unravel a human connectome. So there are lots of ways which people can be different. Now, what I would say is that if you are to start talking about variants within people of the same type, perhaps start with how much can the type itself vary, and how much the type theory already has explanation for that. So one way in which I'd look at that is to go back what we talk, to what we're talking about before, which is transitions. The idea that people of the same type can change and be in certain states. Now, it seems to me that with Quentin Tarantino, you have someone who spends far more time in that highly confident space of extroverted sensation. And whereas you have in Christopher Nolan, 
someone who actually is in a rather different space, more, I'd say, of extroverted intuition, yeah. where he's more conceptual, more about the ideas. I knew you were going to say that's that. Not to say, let's not say Tarantino. So was that? I said, I knew you were going to go, go into that. You were going to say that. You were going to yeah. say that Nolan is any focused, any focused, whereas Tarantino is S-E, quote unquote, focused. Yes. Interesting. Inter okay. And if you look, and if you look at the nature of their films, you'll also see that. Yeah, yeah, it, it's pretty apparent. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I think Tarantino has a lot more confidence, but it also makes him a lot more insufferable. Yeah, <laughs> he's a bit, he's a bit out there for sure. <laughs> and that's also why I use Tarantino as the example, the video example of insufferable extra sensation in an LIE, in that I'm shutting your butt down. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so I, okay, okay, I'm having quite a few questions I just want to ask. Well, where do I, okay. One, why, I want to ask you personally, why do you put so much emphasis on the mobilizing function? Like, how come when, when typing people, you don't, Put an em the same amount of emphasis on the creative or the demonstrative or identifying those or any other other functions it seems to always come back to the mobilizing you try to identify where a person is too big for their boots where their source of hubris is can you tell me why well you say emphasis i'd like to think i put emphasis on all the different functions mm. but you you've you've had some as you've already made implicit some assumptions in what you mean by emphasis. If emphasis is to be focusing on those things which show up a lot and seem to me to be, well, more like sticking out like a sore thumb. In other words, what is useful for typing? A mobilizing function is more likely to stick out like a sore thumb than a creative function. Um, I would go and say that next to the leading function, the other thing which looks and uh, um, like a leading function is the mobilizing. Why is this? It all comes down to dichotomies. The leading function and the mobilizing function are the, the only two functions which are both valued and bold and also inert or something as stubborn. When you have something which is valued, um, bold, and stubborn, that means it's essentially being pushed out onto your space. It is basically pronouncing itself as being here, and it's my way or the highway. This is why I call the leading and the mobilizing functions the assertive functions. Um, whereas you look at a creative function, it's not an assertive function. It's very cooperative, in fact, not assertive. But can I bring it's something not... up? There is something yeah, sure. I think, sure. Um, if, so if I'm not mistaken, the creative function is part of what is known as the contact in the uh, contact versus inert dichotomy. Yes. So yes. in the creative function, especially, is a contact mean that it's the function that we use to make contact with the world with other people. And when it comes to the creative function specifically, that's the one we use to contribute to other people and individuals as well. So wouldn't that mean well, that you would see that a lot and become apparent in, in interactions with other people? Well, this is why I have different names for things. Sorry, Solomon, let's pause a little bit. Are you still there? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, no, it's better now. Right. This is why I have different names for things. Because I think if we don't get our terminology clear, we get to, you know, understandings like the idea that contact means this makes contact. I don't think that's the case because it seems to me to be very strange that leading function wouldn't be something we'd make contact with people with. So I, I don't think that's right. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to intuitively make sense. Uh, could it make sense despite intuitively making sense? Uh, um, I don't know. I mean, the idea that say an extra, an EIE or an ESC wouldn't make contact with their extroverted ethics to people that strikes me as absurd. Um, so I don't think that's the right way of understanding contact as opposed to inert. And I think the key thing here is inert, not moving. And contact is sort of Flexible. not only touching, but rather being touched 
by things. And that's the key point, I think, that inert and contact are about. One resists being changed by the things it comes into contact with. Hmm. The other is changed, is pliable by um, other inputs, other um, suggestions. There's, it's an open so, system, open line of communication between the outside world and the self. Yes. And not only that, even with other functions. With Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So... What, so what I would say is that whereas a leading function is very command control, right? Look at the relationship between the leading function and the ignoring function. They're both inert. When to, where, where one thing is inert, its inverse is also inert, right? So there is very much a relationship of, yeah, the leading function subordinates the, the ignoring. But I don't think that's the case between the creative and the demonstrative. I think they have far more of a partnership because mm. I think they're both contact. They're actually working together in some kind of way. Now, one's valued and one's not valued. Nevertheless, the demonstrative is being fed through the creative all the time. And I think that's why you get the word creative, because it's factoring in other things, factoring other, other ideas from its inverse in the way that in which the leading is not the leading function is quite parochial in, right. in comparison in okay also the creative function is a producing function so it, it produces information it accepts from the um, leading it produces an output or a product for other people if i'm not mistaken that also is another line of communication between the self and other people involved well, if that's the case, then Immanuel Kant and Baruch Spinoza, uh, are they ILEs now because they've produced structures and philosophies for us to benefit from? Because yeah. it's their, must be a producing function. I'd say yes, no. if that's the case. I don't know them. So look, I don't know these yeah, types. No, no, I haven't no, typed no, them. Fair enough. It would be fair based enough. on that, yeah. Is, I, again, I don't think that's the salient way of, of splitting up the functions, that some produce things and others don't produce things. So it suggests that, an, EI, that say, an EIE doesn't produce something of extroverted ethics. It, it, it is producing, it's emitting it all the time. And, and, and if it's not simply a case of emission, it's a case of producing something which other people benefit from, that becomes a bit... Um, What's the word? It's a bit forced. It, it sounds a bit sort of put together. I would instead say that when understanding, accepting and producing, right? So the, what, what do I, am I producing introverted ethics now? Is that is that right? I, I actually produce more introverted ethics, my extrovert intuition. That again, sounds very, very strange. Now, I, I would say that instead, the relationship between accepting and producing functions I think it's important to see it, first of all, within the block. And I think the idea here is that one is meant to set the need and the other is meant to fulfill the need. And I think to, to understand what the right definition is, you need to connect it up to what it means to be a rational and irrational type. Because if you're a rational type, all the rational elements are the accepting ones and the irrational elements are the producing ones and vice versa for, for irrational types. There has to be something about, I think, um, why you're doing what you're doing and what is the thing being done in service of the why. So that's how I think of accepting producers. I, I call it something different. I call it demanding supplying because I think that kind of better matches mm. that, that relationship. And I think that's best represented in the ego block, which I think is the one block which isn't dysfunctional. The ego block is meant to be the ideal of the interaction between a demander and a supplier. The leading function is built in all ways to be a demander, right? Because it's, it's, um, it is the inert one. The demander probably should be inert, given that it's setting the need. It shouldn't be, you know, buckling and twisting with suggestions. It also needs to be, I think, the more bold one, the one which sort of shows up a lot more, um, has plenty of energy supplied to it, um, because that's the one which is setting the need. It's starting things off. It needs to be 
um, evaluatory. It needs to be on. You can't have your needs switch on and off, really. That's the first part of it, etc., etc. The leading fits the bill every single time. And vice versa, right? The the on the other hand, the creative fits the bill for being a perfect producer. It's not on all the time, it's there when it's called upon by the leading function. And it very sup supply and subtly and flexibly meets the needs very effectively. It is like the butler. You ring the bell, the butler comes along, does everything you need to do. So it, they, they work perfectly together. You then look at the superego, which is meant to be dysfunctional, right? And it is meant to be dysfunctional. It's weak, it's unvalued, because it should be dysfunctional. There you have the role. The role is not a very good demander. It is flexible, for one. It is reacting to external demands and pressures. It basically becomes what is expected of me and how do I need to sort of put up with that? And it calls upon the vulnerable function to supply whatever it needs. And the vulnerable function won't do that because it's inert. It's a computer says no function, hence the failure of the superego. And why if you want to use your role function effectively, you actually have to do a bit of vertical blocking with your creative function. And we see that in practice. We see, say, an ILI, right? If they are utilizing their role function, introverted sensation, it's going to be far more of a logistical, practical. In other words, the functional details of their areas of interest than it is in terms of, you know, making people feel cozy and at home and, you know, engaging in extroverted ethics to support introverted sensation. That's, that's just a double whammy failure. So we see it across the board, really, of all the types. They have to engage in vertical blocking for their role function to actually work. Um, now, if you look at the um, superid block, again, it's dysfunctional, but it's a different kind of dysfunction. Wait, before Here, you it's move where on, the... Yeah. Before you move on to the superid, I had a question about the block, the, the, the previous block. I wanted to yes. ask about the role function specifically. So yeah. the role function is the place of uh, social adaptation. It's what the world expects from you. So you're reacting to meet those needs. I want to ask you, all right, this is more a practical as opposed to theoretical. Does this mean, imply that um, people can feel a sense of bitterness or hatred having to, to f feeling like they're being forced to use their role function when they don't want to use it. So can a person, can an yes. LIE have a sort of animosity or, or bitterness towards FE related activities because they feel like they have to put on that fake mask yes. and stuff like that? I think they can. Um, one thing we'll say, I know Glenko uses the word social adaptation. Oh. I don't use social adaptation for one key reason. I don't think it's necessarily social. Social already precludes a more a more ethical sensory space. True. Oh, okay. And when I said social, I meant like a broad term for people, just you know, just interacting I with humans. That's what I'm. I about. think it's just the a world adaptation. Okay, world adaptation. That's a better word. Okay. Yeah, world adaptation. Whatever's out there, that's not you. So, I would say yes, and I I call it the um, the struggle. Um, interaction um, the struggle interaction comes about from the the masking transition what's the masking transition it's when you're moving away from your leading function into your role like that's not very nice is it having to move away from the leading function yeah. to your role it feels unnatural it is unnatural you're doing it because you realize there's a necessity for you to do it you don't want to have to but you do so that is a masking transition. That leads to the struggle interaction. What is the struggle interaction? That's between, okay, I should probably plug in my computer because it's going to turn off soon. Where, how far am I in terms of needing to turn off? Uh, okay, I'll, 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 I'll speak a little bit more than I'll go and um, plug in. But um, yeah, that's the relationship between your suggestive and your role. It sets up by being in your struggle interaction. It sets up a need to be freed and that f you're only freed your salvation comes from your suggestive function which is not provided by you it also comes from the outside because again this is a contact flexible zone 
you are being in one area you're being impressed on by everyone's demands in the other area you're being impressed on by people willing to satisfy your needs so by having your needs satisfied right it frees you from the pressure of people making demands of you and what people do in this world is they almost sacrifice the fulfillment of their needs by trying to meet everyone's demands on them and hence it is a place of great resentment that is interesting okay i i had the suspicion that 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 is a source of resentment for a lot of people and yes. and then once you started breaking it down i could actually see why the theoretical aspects as to why right because but now it's making okay that is interesting um let yeah? me just go plug in sure, right sure. sure 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 All right, I think that was pretty interesting. I think it was pretty interesting, the fact that we're talking about role function and not just looking at the theoretical aspects of it, but also breaking down the uh, practical aspects of it in human behavior. I had the suspicion that the role function was a source of bitterness and resentment in a lot of people. All right. All right, okay, that's interesting. I'm just thinking about what, what was the next question. I had a question I wanted to ask him, but it just sort of escaped me for a second there. But let's see. And I had actually um, a new thought when I was heading downstairs that we end up in that sort of struggle interaction. Um, I think partly due to the the namby pambiness, the wishy washiness of the suggestive function, it can barely articulate itself as a need. It doesn't really even know itself. It's a sort of thing where you know you're getting what you you need when it's provided to you. But without that, it's almost like the itch you can't scratch. Right. Now compare that to the mobilizing function. The mobilizing function, that's a need which knows itself and hence it becomes an aspiration. That isn't... It's not waiting for someone. You don't sit around waiting for someone to scratch your itch. You just it do it. a mobilizing function. You go out yeah. and you do it. You push yeah. yourself out, exactly. And in doing that, right, suddenly, it, and by that, that's a kind of inertness again, stubbornness, right? But as a result, the vulnerable function is so stubborn, right? The vulnerable function knows, right? All these demands and pressures, I'm having nothing to do with it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not reacting to it, right? So in a way, you you, you empower yourself in, in, in the, um, what I call the hubris interaction, in the struggle interaction, because the need is so wishy-washy and unable to speak for itself, you end up meeting everyone else's demands. Right. Okay. Um, that's interesting. And so you would say that it is the suggestive exclusively that we try to outsource and the mobilizing, we never try to outsource to anybody else. All right. So, um, yeah, I mean, what happens with mobilizing is that it is best equipped to, well, the function best equipped to meet the mobilizing is the creative and someone else. The creative. So the creative, okay. yeah. right? And what the creative does, whereas the suggestive function is best suited by the leading function of someone else, and other someone coming in and telling you what you need and providing it, right? The mobilizing doesn't want to be told what it needs. It doesn't want to be shown the answer. It wants to be almost more subtly supported and helped. This is what I want. This is what I want to get to do. And I need you to help me with this particular area, but don't show me how to do it. I want to do it myself. I just want you to be there by my side, just in case I fall flat on my face. Mm. All right. All right. Okay. Interesting. It wants the reward and the glory of doing it itself and acting like it didn't need help. Interesting. Yeah. All right. What, what Which types do you think are the most ambitious types? When you say ambition, what do you mean by ambition? A, a strong determination and drive to achieve success. Well, it's going to be the extroverted gammas. The extroverted. Now, are you? I should have probably defined success, or at least talked about where you get your idea of success. It might be external or it might be internal. Can you say that? Well, what what is success that is internal? As in, I decide to do something. 
it, it's meaningful to me. I go, I work hard to do it, and I get it, and it's done. Regardless if it's if it's valued by other people. Well, I mean, if you've done something, I'd always say that's external. Okay, I'm thinking in terms of motivation, I guess, or, or, or yeah. valuation. So if you if you, if you if it if it is to manifest in a concrete achievement, you have done something, you have built something, you have achieved a thing, right? I think that's external. And I would say that concrete achievement is in the realm of SC and T E. Yeah. Um, and I'd say when it comes to an introverted gamma, yes, they, they do value personal achievement, don't get me wrong. But I think for them, it's more about, um, or it's the, the role they take more often is um, making sure that they are not doing and not allowing in bad possibilities. How about beta quadro? You, would, you wouldn't describe at least extroverted kind, SLE, IEE, to be ambitious in any way? They have an ambition. It's just a different sort of thing. It's not about being personally successful. It's about have maximizing their impact. It is not about what they have achieved. It is what it is the effect for whatever they have done has had on others. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so, so in other words, uh, an extroverted beta, um, it's about having a reputation that like Andrew Tate. Yeah. Yeah. It's having the loudest voice. It's having the most influential voice. Kanye and that West. doesn't necessarily mean, yes, and doesn't Tupac. necessarily mean achieving a thing. It's about existing. It, 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 these type, that the extroverted beaters, what they want is not really achievement. It's almost to exist. Recognition, in their mind. Say? Yes, in their minds, they don't really exist unless they are in people's heads. <laughs> okay, interesting. It's like they don't matter. They're not real. They're not true unless that is recognized. Interesting. Okay. It's like um, I'm not sure. If it, is that 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 night very cute Disney film? What was it about? About sort of dead people uh, in Mexico. And the idea is that the spirits of the dead, they fade away unless people are remembering them. Yeah, legacy, basically. Having a legacy and being right. remembered. A legacy and being remembered. And it, uh, some sort of image of you that people hold on to long after you exist, long after everyone you've known personally themselves has died. You are immortalized by in the memory of people. That That is what it means to truly exist. Um, by the measure of an extroverted beta. Would a gamma ever think this way? They wouldn't particularly care about the people who'd be remembering them. Like, who are these people? I, I don't know them from Adam. Why would I be interested? I mean, they being part of history. Like, I'd imagine like an LIE or SEE would, would want to be part of history in some way. Think of Napoleon. I think he was an SEE, right? I think he's an SLE. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, then. So yeah. um, Julius Caesar maybe is a, is is a similar example who I think is an SEE. Again, it's this is where it becomes you know trickier because are they doing it to have achieved something, gotten something done, or are they doing it to have been remembered? It also gets complicated with an SEE specifically because they're the one who grows from extroverted ethics to extroverted logic. So often an SEE is a type that can try to figure out whether they have been personally successful by gauging the mood and the reaction because they can more easily read that than whether they have actually been effective in right. they're dumb. Um, so, but they are interested ultimately in whether they've been effective in what they've done, if they've actually solved the problem, if they've actually made that thing work that wouldn't have worked if they hadn't actually done that thing. Um, Right. So yeah, which types? Okay, I I, I kind of know the answer you're already gonna give because I think you've talked mm -hmm. about this before. But which types do you think have the strongest personal connection to uh, manifest destiny? All right, which types want the idea of manifesting destiny and being remembered? Are we talking about the American ideal of um of of, of Americans moving? I say Americans uh, at the time the. 
the non-Native Americans moving west. Is that what you mean by manifest destiny? No, I mean, it, it, I'm, no, I don't mean this specific like that. I mean more a bit more broad, like, okay, okay manifest destiny. I want to obtain a goal, be remembered for the rest of my life. Or um, what's his name? Elon right. Musk wants to set up a big company or it could be anybody. Somebody who wants to set right. up a big company or, or an endeavor or some project or whatever to be remembered for years to come and build yeah. a legacy. This goes very much into introvert intuition. But mm -hmm. I think the idea of it is, is my manifest destiny to do this thing, I think, leans more often towards, yeah, perhaps more beta and F, especially for something to be remembered by um, beta and F. Um, this idea of having this passion and believing you're always going to be this thing. Think of the EIEs or the IEIs who set out to be a great artist or a star, right? That That's manifest destiny. Um, but equally, you could say that um, an LIE or an ILI can feel they have some sort of interest. And the thing is, they call it an interest rather than a purpose in life. They tend to be far less dramatic about it because that dr dramaticness is more NI and FE together. Um, I, I would also say that, um, yeah, it's it's less about destiny when it comes to introvert and tradition with extrovert and logic. It's more about autonomy rather than destiny. I think destiny is something it suggests in some way that the universe has called upon you to do that thing. And I think that well, okay. and I, let, let, me clarify, and I, let me clarify that. Okay, on, destiny as in a person who creates their own destiny. I should have said that. Well, oh, sorry, that. Well, that's a very different matter. It is. It is right? a very different matter. That's yeah. an entirely different matter. Because if it's that you have a calling, right, that suggests some to some some way that the universe is sort of held together by some sort of force, and you are a small part in that greater force. A gamma isn't going to want to think in that sort of way because they want to break themselves away from any other thing which might control them. A beta will love the idea that they have been appointed by the forces of the universe to sit up and over anything and everything else. <laughs> that, that's the, the, the dream. Does aristocrat um, being aristocratic play into that in terms of the Ren and the well, economies? I'd say it's why people think of aristocrat the way they think of it. All the right. problem is it doesn't work for the deltas that way at all. Oh, yeah, true, true. It, does, it doesn't happen to work for the betas. Right. Okay, anyways, continue. Um, finish what you were saying. What were you saying before? Yeah. Sure. So, yeah, I'd say for a gamma, no, it's about creating my own destiny very much. It's about autonomy very, very much. Figuring out where my life uh, is going to go and, you know, utilizing, think, taking initiative to get it to go in that way. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, because interesting. All right, all right. I mean, for gamma, gammas definitely want to have their hands on the steering wheel for sure. In yes. everything they do. Of, of their own lives, definitely. Other people's lives, not so much. No. Yeah. Um. They, but they're even more than they tend to think even more than in terms of having their own hand of a steering wheel. It's keeping everyone else's hands off, off. their steering wheel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's definitely spot on. Interesting. Okay. Um. Would you happen to know, okay? So let's. I want to ask you a question about celebrities types. All right, just for entertainment purposes, because we've had a lot of arguments in in, in the World Socialist Group regarding. Yeah. Would you happen to know Fifty Cent's type? I've had so many debates and nego. And um, I have no idea. I, I, I'm I, unfortunately for a, 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 a posh Jewish Brit, right? I don't have a particularly good knowledge of people who do rap. That's a way to put it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I should probably should probably consider the person I'm asking the question to before I ask them to. Right. <laughs> oh my god. Okay. Um controversial controversial thought. A lot of people hate me for yeah. this. I think Arnold is an ILI. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Schwarzenegger. Yeah. Okay. I'm pretty sure you're gonna be so shocked. You're gonna be, yeah. I'll give you my my reasoning for why I don't think he's an ILI. And what type do you but think I'd be he is? Interested in hearing your reason for why you think he is an ILI. Okay. Arnold Schwarzenegger. 
I think is someone who is very much about uh, just just FYI, Porcupine. This is this is for Porcupine Jason specifically because he we've been going back and forth over this. All right, this is specifically right. because of Porcupine Jason. I'm asking okay. this question, okay. and I know I'm gonna get most people disagreeing with me, but whatever, I don't care. Okay, I, I look at Arnold Schwarzenegger and I see uh, an Austrian fellow, right, with initiative and a desire to make a name for himself. And I think that that's the idea is that he would make a name for himself, first of all, by being a bodybuilder, by, by you know, working on his body, making himself, you know, as big as possible and um, making videos of himself, pumping and talking about it being almost like a sexual experience <laughs> and generating controversy <laughs> and that sort of stuff. But eventually, once he eventually wants to become not only well known, but actually respectable going into acting after bodybuilding again all that being a showman and then going into politics again appearing very much up there up front with other people um not being a, in the, a particularly um not being naturally very charismatic but very much wanting to be seen in the charismatic light um and utilizing his body and his ability to work on himself more than finding the perfect tone or pitch. I mean, you've got to factor in mind he's also not a native English speaker, but he hasn't really, you know, he learned English, of course, but he hasn't really focused on crafting himself into like, you know, something other than himself, which is a guy who, you know, works on his body and has been very effective at doing that. Um, not the best actor. <laughs> But still, that's debatable. Went into that. That, that's debatable. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, maybe. I, I, don't know. I mean, he's he, not top he's ten. At, he's not top ten. He's, he's not top twenty, he's but he's good. Yeah, no, he's okay. not top ten. He plays a good cyborg. So, no, <laughs> no he's a cyborg. He plays a good android. Very Andro well. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, to be fair, I thought it was pretty good in Total Recall. I liked him in Total Recall. Right. Um, but you know, he's a man of action, a man of doing things, running around, someone who wants to be seen being a man of action, doing things and running around, whether that's in politics, whether that's in acting, whether that's initially in bodybuilding. I don't see someone there who doesn't value extroverted ethics. I see, in my view, I think he's an SLE. Yeah. My friend Peter thought he was an EIE, but it's like, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, a lot of I people. Think would say his, yeah. his baseline was figuring out how to get huge right <sighs> and, and okay. that was he was he that was his bread and butter and he was aiming towards becoming seen with having notoriety having street cred all the rest and he's always had a good tough guy image around him he hasn't had much versatility in reshaping and changing how he comes across but he clearly wants to be seen and be out there and doing stuff Okay, interesting. Yeah, that's that's usually what people conclude. They, that's the consensus is that he's yeah. SLE. So that's why do you think I lie? Right. So let's start off by his orientation. All right, mm -hmm. introvert versus extrovert. I don't th if if introversion is the refinement, quality, integration, and extra and extroversion is expansion, quantity. All right. I actually don't think Arnold falls in the category of extrovert. He's actually more of an introvert. And the reason why is because he himself, in many of his interviews, has said multiple times over and over again that the key to his success was having a vision of where he wanted to go in the future and holding on to that vision and staying true to that vision and not letting anything else distract him from that vision. When he lifts weights... It's not about, oh, how, how heavy can I lift these weights? Which, by the way, he was on steroids. That's another thing. His athletical prowess was from steroids. It's not, it's not like he is phys really a 4DSE. I don't think he's actually 4DSE, and I'll get to why. I think he appears to be because of the steroids, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll get to that. So introversion, he has specifically said over and over again, that for him, it's about maintaining a focus, a narrow lane, and not only that, but there have been many 
occasions where he has been offered business deals, which he has turned down. Now, the reason why he turned them down, and these are in interviews where he says, he says he turned them down specifically because they weren't within the scope of his vision and where he wanted to go. It was outside that lane. This to me tells me he's not really oriented towards breadth and increasing the quantity. He's more about refining and maintaining the quality of his path or whatever it happens to be. That's one. He's, his overall demeanor and his communication with other people is quite passive. When you look at him in his interviews, he is not an energetic. He's not like a, like a Donald Trump all right, or like a Dave Ramsey. He, he doesn't have that high intensity energy. He's actually a very passive person when he's doing his interviews. And he's just, you know, not really initiating as much as he's, he takes a more of a responding role. These are some of the reasons why I think he's actually an introvert and not an extrovert. I think he goes, I think he puts a lot of effort into his image, into coming off like that big muscular extroverted man. But he himself is not really an extrovert. Other than that, uh, if we talk about, um, let's go back to the topic of SE, right? I don't think he has 4D SE because what I understand from 1D SE, dimensionality of, SE, uh, of the IMEs is that one dimensional functions can be improved upon, but in specific contexts. Once you take them outside, they can't improve or work on that, in, that, in that area as well. Now, Arnold was really good at just lifting weights. And on top of that, he took steroids. And on top of that, he started at a very young age, so he, he clocked in his 10,000 hours of work. All right, so, I mean, I, I can go further, but I'll, I think I'll just stop here yeah. for now just to hear what you have to say. Okay. But I can go further. Okay. Yeah. I'd be in a couple of things. First of all, I'd be interested to, to know what he's articulated as being his vision. Um, that's one thing. Another thing is the reason why I'd like to know what that vision is, is whether that vision is for him to just to get famous. No, no, it was, because it was more, he said he wanted to go into bodybuilding, then go into acting. And then he wanted to marry a Kennedy. He had this thing thought out decades before so he achieved point. any of this. Marry a Kennedy. Yeah. Why? I don't know. It was just one of his, one of the goals that he had. But again, marry a Kennedy. That is, I mean, think about this, right? To marry a Kennedy. Status. Right. Is and he... not any status. Not any status. That is perhaps the least introverted ethics thing possible. Think about it, right? Mm. I want to marry a Kennedy. I don't care who they are. I mean, that they're a Kennedy is important to me. Not that they are a person I actually personally like. Right. I would, I would be that, that, in my opinion, would rule out an ILI. But there are other points you're making which I think carry value. Right, so what I would see is carrying value. So you saying that a key thing for him was actually his, like, first of all, a certain passivity, perhaps, or rather not as active as a Donald Trump, maybe. Also, a guy who has a very clear vision of where he wants to go, and very much about holding to his vision, not letting anything distract him from that. So he's saying he saw it almost procedurally. I go into bodybuilding. Yeah. I go into acting. I then marry a Kennedy. Right. I go into politics, yeah. basically. Right. So first of all, I think that's a very extroverted ethics oriented, at least valued vision. Doesn't necessarily mean it's strong or pushed. It could be that if you make him an introvert, what would be the most feasible introverted type, which is also still low in extroverted ethics? I don't think he's very high in extroverted ethics, not really. I think he values it, but I think he's high in it. It seems to me a good typing could be LSI. Yeah, LSI could be a good typing. Hmm. Maybe that's the compromise. I'd be interested to, I'll, I'll, I need to think it through more because he's a guy, he put together a system and yeah, in one hand he took steroids, but come on, there are lots of bodybuilders taking steroids, True, it's more than just taking steroids. It's more than that, but true. And, and, and another thing we need to consider is Arnold is an anomaly. He's not a normal person, regardless of whatever his sociotype no. is. He's an unusual, no. you don't, you don't come across a guy like Arnold on the streets. 
He's an no. unusual person. That's no. another thing I'd like to also factor in and consider. LSI could be. I mean, I, I do think a lot of the, the LSI is even closer to ILI. The two t tend to get conflated a lot, I guess. Benefit and I guess cycle. Benefit cycle and also bold and I. I think bold and I just makes more sense for Arnold. Like I have a hard time seeing him as being suggestive or, or being wishy-washy with his NI. It also makes sense that an LSI, I think, is more likely to be an effective bodybuilder than an, than an SLE. Because they have SI, right? They have the fluid interplay of SE and SI. SE, yeah. There's so much about bodybuilding, it's not just about, you know, pushing yourself. It's about maintaining. It's about maintaining. Yeah. Day in, day out discipline to maintain that bulk you built up. True. Yeah. yeah. LSI could be a very good typing, actually. I could see that could as well. Be. Interesting. I need to give it more thought, but yeah, uh, I think that there's a good potential there. It would explain why he's, you know, as far as, uh, you know, an LSI legal, he's not actually that controversial. No, he's not. He's no, not compared to Donald Trump. He doesn't really push the mark. He kind of plays it. He plays it pretty safe. You know, okay. The video about him, you know, oh, you know, you know, lifting the weights, like, it's like, it's like coming. It's like, it's a like, come on. It's very cheap stuff. It's not, um, it's not really pushing it that much. So, yeah, I would be interested to, maybe he is LSI. I, I, I could, I could embrace that. I'm, yeah. I'm trying, my mind's starting to move towards LSI. Um, even, yeah, I might change my typing of him based on that. Thanks for the insights. Oh, no problem. All right. No problem. Hmm. Yep. What type do you think Batman is? I, I, I think you're going to say LSI as well. Yeah. Yeah. Batman but is it LSI. Depends on, on the, the rendition. Game. Yeah. I, that's what I wanted to get into yeah. as well. I wanted to get into the, the topic of, of ca fictional character analysis depends on the portrayal. I yeah. think in general, the MBTI people say Batman is an ILI. I don't think he is an ILI. I think in general, Batman is an LSI. I do think that Batman in the Christopher Nolan rendition might be actually an ILI. And I think that the the Chris, what's his name? What's the guy's name? Robert Pattinson's rendition of Batman is an alpha quadratype, for example. But I think in general, he's an LSI. The character of Sorry, Batman. Sorry, Robert Pattinson's Batman's alpha quadra? Possibly. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen the film. Oh, I, okay. I can't. You all right, all right. It, it, it just it just beggars belief for any any a portrayal of Batman. To Possibly, be I'm not I'm not quite sure about that one though, because I that one's yeah. a bit like eh, maybe, but the Christopher yeah. Nolan one I think is is, is actually an ally in that rendition. Oh, I thought I thought ESI. ESI, huh? Oh, okay. That would yeah. be this. That would be my second guess is ESI because yeah, bold FI and NI. Yeah, yeah. No out there to kill evil people not yeah. kill but like you know punish evil yeah. people yeah no Basically, esi makes sense that'll be the second most likely type because yeah. they both have bold but, fi and si yeah. fi yeah. and uh, yeah. sorry but lsi in general is what batman is and, and, and i've think, seen that as well i think mo most portrayals of batman i think are the animated series definitely LSI, LSI. Yeah. No. right the, DC, the whole DC animated universe is, yeah, almost always LSI. The whole universe? Him or or, 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 the, or just him, right? Batman. You're not yeah, talking about other no, characters. It, it, in any portrayal of Batman in the DC animated universe it is LSI. Right, right. Okay. That's interesting. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't I think I have any more questions to ask, to be honest. The, we can end the conversation here if you want yeah, or if you want to yeah yeah you get to sleep because we've got um early wake up but it's right. been a pleasure Solomon. yeah you too it was nice talking thank you for uh giving me your time so we can talk about thank this. you for inviting me on sure thing sure thing all right anyways you have a good night and see you guys as well all right goodbye everyone bye-bye